Hey, if you have a Bible today or look at the screens, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. I want to share with you a series that I'm beginning called Resurrection. And this is an inter- inter- interesting series, not only because it starts today, but it's interesting to me and how factual it is on the things we need to look at and concerning the resurrection. You know, we need reminders that it's not just a day, but an event that happened, but it's something of transformation to you and I as believers. And in Matthew chapter 28, notice what it says here. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse number 1. This is one of the classic scripture texts, but I like this in in Matthew. It says this. It says, now after, verse 1, it says, now after the Sabbath on the first day of the week began, Mary Magdalene and and the other Mary came to the tomb. And watch this in verse number 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I don't know about you. To me, that is a powerful thing, an earthquake that's happening right at this moment. And look what happens in verse number three. And his countenance, talking about the angel, was like lightning and his clothes was white as snow. Now, I had to watch the Ten Commandments last night. It's my favorite Christian movie, some of you know. And it's pretty good, but I'm telling you what, this is even better if you could just see it with the eye of your imagination. And it says his clothes, it says his countenance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards, watch this now, the guards shook for fear. Now, it wasn't just the, the, the two women that were there. The guards shook in fear like dead men. And then the angel didn't say to the guards, but said to the women, notice this. And by the way, it's interesting to me that the first appearance of Jesus was seen by women. And all the ladies said, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, guys, we'll get it. I promise you we will get it after a while. In the, and he said, and the angel said, do not be afraid for I know who you seek, Jesus who was crucified. And look at verse six. Everybody check out verse six. Watch this now. In verse number six, it says, he is not here for he is risen. And well, I like this. And he said, come and see the place where they laid him and quickly and, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead indeed. And he's going before you into Galilee that there will you see him. Behold, all, behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples his word. So notice what's happening here. The resurrection of Jesus is not just a, a hearsay, it's a, it's, a, it's a historical fact. And I want to bring to you three things real quickly about this. It's interesting. You know, there's the empty tomb is proof, number one, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Number two, there's eyewitnesses. Not only to these women that saw Jesus being uh, resurrected from the dead, but all the other witnesses that testify to the fact that Jesus is who he is. And then number three is the changed lives. As a matter of fact, it's so interesting to me when you look at the Bible and you look at Peter as you see his life, how he went from one thing in the, in the Gospels to the book of Acts, he becomes this superman of transformation. And why is that? Because the resurrection, the resurrection impacted him so much and changed his life in such a powerful way. He went from being this cowardly, insecure man to this powerful man in the book of Acts. And why is that? That's because of the resurrection, ladies and gentlemen. And that same power is here today. That same power is what takes Christianity. Christianity forward. As a matter of fact, I think one of the greatest witnesses, and by the way, my, my, my message today is not really trying to prove Jesus' uh, resurrection, but I think the greatest, to me, the greatest testimony of Jesus' transformation is his own brother, his stepbrother, James, who's the, the book of James, is he's the author of that. He's the first Christian leader, and you got to go back in time, and James was completely opposed to Jesus when he walked the earth. He completely did not believe. He gave Jesus the hardest time and he was one of the first men after the resurrection to acknowledge Jesus, not his Lord and Savior, but in the book of James, he refused to be called Jesus' brother. He was so humbled by the fact that Jesus was who he was and who he said he was, he became, and he just became a, a servant of God, but yet he was his, technically his brother. I think that is a powerful witness, ladies and gentlemen, of transformation. And if you don't think Jesus is alive, check this out as we read in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 9. It says that it says in verse 9 it says they went to tell his disciples behold Jesus met them and said rejoice and look what it says here so they came and they and they beheld him by his feet and worshiped him and they and then Jesus said to him do not be afraid go and tell my brethren and go to Galilee and there they will see me and notice verse 11 
And while they were going, behold, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priest all these things that were happening. Now watch this. The very religious people that crucified Jesus, look what's happening here in verse number 11. They're going to, they're going to the religious people, and it says in verse 12, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted them, they gave them a large sum. Everybody say large sum. A large sum of money, watch this, to do what? And they're saying in verse, th- verse number 13, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole away his body while we slept. And verse number 14, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure, talking to the Roman guards. But they knew that Jesus was risen. I mean, these men of authority knew the truth, yet, you know, they were like anybody else that didn't know the Lord at that time. They just took the money and said, whatever your religious traditions. But notice what it says in verse 15. They took the money and did as they were instructed, and the saying is commonly reported among Jews until this day. I mean, there is this deception that goes on, not in this country necessarily, but in other countries, especially in Israel among the Jewish people, that Jesus was, you know, uh, where, you know, he was just, his body was taken by his disciples and buried. I've just got this question for you. If that's the truth, then how come Peter and James, if they knew that Jesus was dead and his body was taken off somewhere, why would they be transformed to the place of transformation they have? Think about that. Why would all the other disciples be that way? If you look, most of the disciples were, most of them were martyred, if not all of them martyred for their faith. If they had taken Jesus' body and did what was said by the uh, elders of that time, talk about these Jewish elders, then why would these men be so bold? You know why? Because there was a transformation. Everybody say transformation. And look what it says over here in Ephesians chapter 2. The resurrection, number two, number one is a historical fact, but number two, the resurrection gives us right standing with God. Everybody say right standing with God. I think that's what to me it's one of the most transforming things as a young man coming up to know that I, I was, again, I was not necessarily seeking the Lord at the time when I was younger. But when I became 19 years old, I began to think, well, man, I, I want to go to heaven, but I want, I want to know God. And I had this desire that even though I was doing things I should not have done, I began to understand, especially as I became a believer, that, that through the blood of Jesus, I've been given right standing with God. And that to me is not something that I earned. It was a gift. Notice what it says here in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number, uh, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 4. It says, but God who's rich in mercy, everybody say rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Watch this. And look at verse number six and raised us up, which means what? We have our own resurrection. He raised us up and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Watch this. It gets even better. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. By grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Everybody say it's the gift of God. Notice that it's the gift of God. Your righteousness, my righteousness with the Lord is not something we do. It's not something we necessarily earn. We receive it. We believe it and receive it. So many people, especially in religious culture, they try to earn their way into right standing with God. And they get guilty because they don't do the things that, you know, the church teaches them to do. If you'll do this and if you'll do that, then you'll have right standing with God. I understand there are things we need to do and you should do. But there comes a place in your relationship with the Lord that it's not about you, but about what he did 2,000 years ago. And what he did 2,000 years ago is all you need. And if you get to that place, there's a sense of freedom. Most people, though, they get to a place where it's bondage. They think, well, if I'll do this, if I'll do that, if I'm good enough, listen, your goodness is not going to make the difference in your life. It's his greatness that makes the difference in your life. Notice what it says here in verse number 10. It says, or verse number nine, excuse me. It says, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we're his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is a beautiful thing that God has prepared for you and I to exercise our lives in. And that is right standing with God. You know, so many people think that once they, uh, you know, 
mess up, that they, they can't really be forgiven, that God holds this against them. Listen, the blood of Jesus has not only forgiven our sins, but wiped out our sins. We're not old sinners saved by grace. We're the righteousness of God. It bothers me that people call, call themselves old sinners who've been believers all these years. I am not a practicing person that's running from God. I'm a practicing person that's running to God. You say, well, Pastor Brian, are you perfect? Absolutely not. But when I, when I make a mistake, I'm not running away from him. I'm running towards him. I'm crying out for this mercy. I'm crying out for this grace. I'm saying, hey, I missed the mark. As a matter of fact, I do this daily saying, Lord, you know, help me to be the very best husband, father, brother, you know, uh, to my sister, to my family. I could go down the list of all the people in my life that I'm immediately connected with to all of you to be the very best I need to be. But it's because of the blood of Jesus, not because of my goodness, but because of that blood, I'm not a practicing sinner. Or I'm the right, righteousness of God, and that right standing with God gives me a sense of freedom. And I'm telling you what, when you get to a place where you, you know, Satan will beat you down when you've done something wrong, will he not? I mean, he'll pull out that guilty stick and say, you know, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? You got to say, listen, it's not about me, it is about the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus is more than enough. Hey, let's look at the point number three, talking about this resurrection. It gives us a transformation. Romans chapter 10, watch this in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. Romans 10, 9, talking about transformation. It says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, watch this, and believe in your heart that what God has raised him from the dead. Notice that phrase right there. God has raised Jesus from the dead. That's the key to salvation. When a person believes that Jesus has been raised from the dead and they know in their heart that he is the resurrected Savior, then a transformation comes into their life. You see, when you, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it, well, notice what it says over here. Hold on. It says, verse number 10. When the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 or watch this on the screen. I'm going to tie these two together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. There is a transformation on the inside of you the moment you were born again. But does that stop? Does that end the day you were born again? No, notice what it says here. It says, if anyone, let's read it together, everybody. If, therefore, if anyone is in Jesus, come on, read it with me. If there's anyone is in Jesus, I can't hear you. <laughs> come on now. Therefore, if anyone is in Jesus Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, things all become new. Watch this now. Old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like resurrection, does it not? Does it just stop at one moment? On October the 16th, 1983, I was born again. But here I am today, all these years later, it's still a transformation in my life. It's still the power of God working in my life. And it's the same with you and I. If you just, if you just relinquish it all to one day, and, you know, not just say, well, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm just going to live through it. No, there's a transformation every single day. The older I get, the better I get. I'm not, it, it, I'm, I'm approaching 60 years old. And I'm really looking forward to it in a couple of years. You know why? Because I see myself getting better. I see myself getting stronger and healthier, spirit, soul, and body. That's the way I look at it. It bothers me greatly that believers, that the older they get, they begin to sense themselves breaking down and falling apart. I'm not going to fall apart. You know, uh, seriously, I, I, I don't look at it like that. It bothers me. It really bothers me. I think in the days ahead, I'm going to be uh, doing a series on that because you say, well, Pastor Ryan, when you get this certain age, you'll feel this same way. But people told me that when I got to 50. But people told me that when I got to 40. And, and all these ages before, they said, when you get to 30, you're going to feel this way. When you get to 40, when you get to 50. And now I'm knocking on 60. And hey, listen, I'm knocking on 60 feeling like, man, I'm better than it was when I was 20. As a matter of fact, the great thing about getting older is I'm wiser. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I thank God for birthdays and the fact that, hey, I'm getting smarter at this thing called life. And you, <laughs> I don't know about you, but most people dread it. I think, and by the way, when I was 20, I had this certain, uh, uh, you know, stability. But now that, that I'm at this age, I'm in more stableness. And I, I just thank God for that. All that comes from a growing relationship with the Lord. And it comes by knowing that when you were born again, this transformation power is still inside of you. As a matter of fact, back over to the book of Romans real quickly. Watch this. Romans chapter 6. This says something really interesting. Romans 6, 1. 
Watch what it says. Shall we continue? What shall we say then? It's a question mark. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, certainly not. Verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know that, no, watch this, verse 3. Do not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, when I was baptized in water in October of 1983, I'm telling you what, verse 4 became a reality to me, a reality to me that day. It says in verse 4, it says, We were buried with him through baptism and death, that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Notice verse 5. Watch this. It says, If we've been united together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is the power of being baptized in water. And by the way, if you've not been baptized in water, those are watching. I've had some inquiries this year. Listen, I'll baptize you either here or you can go fill up your tub, put me on the speakerphone. Now wear some, you know, you need to wear a bathing suit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you need to, you know, okay, I'm all into the Adam clothing, but listen, you, you, wear, you wear a bathing suit. You get into that tub, and we will walk you through this, and you can be baptized, okay? You say, well, Pastor Brian, is, is it the water? No, it's not the water. It's not the bathtub. It's not this area. It's not anything special. You know what it is? It's what it says here in verse number four. When you're buried with him by baptism, and, and again, if you're sitting in a tub, I mean, this tank is perfect, but if you're sitting in a tub, and you literally just raise up after you go back. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the symbolism of what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus was resurrected. And you're resurrected into that new life. It's a powerful experience. And if you've never been baptized in water, you see me, you contact me, we'll work something out, or you could do it in your bathtub or your swim pool or whatever. I wouldn't do it in a hot tub necessarily because that might be a little uncomfortable. But anyway, if the water is okay. But I'm serious. It's not the water. It's not the place. It's not even me. It's about you and what happens in your heart, but the symbolism is powerful. And when you make the decision that this is symbolizing what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago, it lives with you forever. I mean, that was, no, that was October of 83, and to this day, even when I read these very verses, that resurrection power is like a, an anointing that comes on me every single time I think about it, because I reconnect with the fact that Jesus is the resurrected Savior, and if he got baptized in water and his life transformed, oh my goodness, what, what, what happened to you and I? And by the way, if you've never done that or want to done that, do that, please see me. We're not going to let any restrictions you know, separate us, but we can work around all those things to see that you experience the greatness of our God in this transformation. Everybody said, amen. Hey, and the next thing that Jesus' resurrection gives us is the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is probably the most misunderstood part of the resurrection because first of all, you can't see him. But second of all is the fact that tradition and religious people simply ignore the moving of the Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit came on Jesus when he was baptized, anointed him for ministry, and on that third day, that earthquake that shook was the resurrection power of the Spirit of God coming through that tomb, and a resurrected Savior came, over, came forth. But what's that have to do with you and I? Romans chapter 8, notice what it says here. Romans chapter 8, check this out. Romans chapter Romans 8, 11. If this weren't in the Bible, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> it is so powerful. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Notice that as a believer. Watch this. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give what to your body? Everybody say life. Life to your mortal body through what? His spirit who dwells inside of you. The spirit of God that dwelled in Jesus that raised him from the dead is the same spirit that lives in you and I. I, I, do, I am so thankful. As watching the Ten Commandments last night, I watch it every time this before. I, I just like that movie, especially at this specific time of the year. But I, I see the, the, my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes among many, is when he climbs the mountain and... Um, and by the way, he's climbing that mountain at 80 years old. Okay? I think that's pretty awesome. I'm not talking about a little hill over here in Cleburne. I'm talking about a mountain, okay? Okay, we got this little thing that Moses climbed this little hill. I mean, he's 80 years old, okay? He climbs that thing, then he goes in there, and then God talks to him. I just, I just, I love that relationship, okay? But then here comes Jesus and walks the earth, and the disciples and all those believers are walking with the Lord. And then when Jesus descends and goes into eternity, or to the right hand of the Father. He sends the Holy Spirit. And this is the beautiful thing about Christianity. God visited us in the Old Testament. Jesus walked with us, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. 
I think that is Christianity is the greatest religion there is, if you call it a religion, because God, the very being that we worship and adore, has deposited himself inside of you and I. And it says this spirit will quicken our bodies. And the only way we can have this happening is we've got to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to commune with us and talk to us. That voice on the inside of you is the voice of your own spirit, but that's the voice of God. And that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, is it Jesus' voice or the Father's voice? It's all three. Somebody asked me, what's the Trinity? It's one times one times one. And what's one times one times one equal? One, right? There are three separate ones, but they're one. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. And God has given you and I this power. Everybody say power. And, and so many believers sort of set it aside. They don't understand it. Churches don't teach it. But we here at Metroplex Family Church, we want you to understand the person of the Holy Spirit. We want you to understand the God within. We want you to understand the relationship that God wants to have with you. That it's not just a point of celebration that you're going to heaven. You can live on heaven and the earth, have heaven on the earth right now. I don't know about you. I needed the, the divine wisdom of God a year ago. Because as a minister, as a pastor, it wasn't that I was concerned financially. My, all my peers were deeply concerned. That's all. We had meetings around this time of the year. They were all concerned about, you know, all this, that. You know, our facilities are debt-free. All those things were, you know, we, we operate in a different manner. I understand churches that have a, an enormous budget, you know, and they depend on people's giving and all that. I mean, you know, they were, I could, I could sense the fear. My situation was not that. My situation was, hold on people being disconnected from each other and from God. I don't know about you. I love people. I really do. And you know, I, listen, I don't love everybody. I mean, I love everybody, but I don't like everybody, okay? Let me rephrase all that. <laughs> I mean, I do. I, well, yeah, I love everybody, but I don't like everybody, okay? And I learned that when I went to Washington, D.C. many times in the past. Man, you can love everybody, but you don't have to like everybody, okay? All right? But my... <laughs> <laughs> My point with all that is, is you got the Spirit of God inside of you, and you want to you want to see people go to the next level. You don't want to see people bound by fear. What about all these questions about sickness and disease and all? All I know is that Jesus is a healing Savior. That His ministry in the earth was about healing. His ministry on the earth was about power. And over here in Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, notice what it says. When and by the way, I would encourage you in the next day or so read the first chapter chapter of Acts. This is the ascension chapter of Jesus. And it says right here in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, one of the things he says, Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said it. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power to live, power to be a witness, power to be the person God's called you to be. And so many churches don't teach that power. They teach, well, just, just hope you can get by and make it if you can. Listen, no, 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 no. That's not Christianity. Jesus was a powerful figure, was he not? And by the way, he was a strong man, was he not? He was a man's man. He was the ultimate John Wayne. I don't know about you. How many, I, listen, with all due respect, I'm 179 pounds and I'm, you know, 5'8", and, and I'm, I consider myself strong, but I'm not as strong as others. But I do my 10,000 steps a day. <laughs> but Jesus was beaten in that garden, uh, not that garden, in that Roman hall. Then he walked the Via Della Rosso. He carried that cross, even though he had a guy help him. But that was out of prophecy. Jesus took that, marched up that hill. Then they laid him on there and he was crucified. And the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice. Do you realize after 39 stripes, I'd have been dead already. Okay, all right. If you ever see the movie, The Passion, Jesus was a powerful person, spirit, soul, and body. And our Savior is not a wimpy, you know, this, they had the pictures of Jesus. When I grew up in this denominational church, they had pictures of Jesus. He looked all anorexic looking. He had two big sheep under his arm and look like he weighed about 100 pounds. That's not the Jesus I serve. The Jesus I serve looks like John Wayne with on a horse and a cowboy hat, okay? <laughs> you know? And always says this thing, do the right thing and do it the right way. And uh, that's the Jesus that I see. And this power is given to you and I through the person of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean that we're to run from problems. That doesn't mean we're to hide from them, but we're to run to them in the power. Everybody say the power. The power of the Spirit of God. And these disciples got a hold of this. They would be went from the, to the most insecure. Listen, none of them were at the crucifixion. 
They were all hiding. Scaredy cats, as Sheila calls them. Scaredy, scaredy, scaredy. And then all of a sudden, the resurrection happens, and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what? They are transforming the world. And they did not have Facebook, did not have an iPhone, and did not have a Toyota Camry or anything else available to them. They did this all with the power of the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you what, you and I have been given and given such a blessing that I believe that we are the hour and the time. I'm not looking. Somebody asked me the other day, said, have you made plans for your cemetery plot? You know, I may do that when I'm 80 plus, maybe 90, but I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I am looking for a hole in the sky. I want to push heaven and earth so close together and the presence of God so matched together that the Lord wants to come back in my lifetime. You know why? Because I have never flown through space without an airplane and I would really like to try it, okay? I'm a Star Trek junkie and to me that would be fun to be transported from here to there. Anyway, moving just right along. You say, Pastor Brian, you're getting strange. No, I'm getting run. This is Christianity. Do we serve the greatest God there is and the God of the Most High, or do we serve a religious God? Hello? I mean, you know, if you want to serve a religious God, fine. I want to serve the real deal. And the real deal is transforming lives and has given us his very spirit, and that very spirit lives in you and I. I'm excited about it, as you can tell. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Watch this. Acts 4, 33. This is something to me. These disciples, you say they were a special group of people. No, they were the first group of people. Let me tell you something. If I'd have lived in that time, I would have been one of the disciples. I would have been. They'd have been Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Brian. <laughs> That's way to be it, okay? And you'd be calling me Apostle Brian now, okay? And I'd have my statues and all that. But no, listen, God wanted Brian to live in this generation. If he wanted me in that generation, you know why? Because they started it, and I see myself ending it, okay? I do. I see myself as the greatest generation. I know that we talk about World War II and all these guys laying on the beach. I've got two uncles that went to Iwo Jima and fought in that war there, fought on that very battleground. They are heroes of heroes. But I consider myself a hero. I consider myself a part of the greatest generation. You know why? Because this technology of the things we're getting to do as people, as a church, I'm telling you what, it's exciting this hour. My dear organization that I support and been a part of for years and years, the Billy Graham organization, Dr. Graham was such a mentor to me and so, such an example before me. And I, I love serving him, as some of you know him. But his son has actually won more people to the Lord than his dad did. And his dad preached face-to-face -to, -face to more people than anyone I'm telling you what, there's a great hour happening right now. Thank God for the people that have come before us, but thank God for where we are today and who we are and where we're going. And you have a part of this. Acts 4.33, watch this. It says this, and let's read this together. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. Now, it says the apostles there, but let's just take that out for a second. It says, with great power, the believers today gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. I don't know about you, great grace is upon believers this year. We went through a very horrible situation. I know people died. I understand that. I don't have all the questions, and I sure don't care about all the politics and to get in a debate with that. But all I know is great grace is what I was believing for this year. Great grace to get us through this. Great grace to see people live and not die. Great grace to see good happen in the midst of evil. Satan is an animal. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the greatness and the goodness and the grace of God is greater than it. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that. I want that in people. I want to see people's lives better. I don't want to see them restricted. I want to see them released to be everything God's called them to be. And I, as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a, as a coach, as a mentor, as a counselor, want to see them empowered to be this, to be a witness to this resurrection. That people, want to, that people look to you not because of where you go to church. They see Jesus Christ inside of you. That's the greatest compliment you can ever have. That's the greatest witness you can ever have, that people would say, hey, I see something different inside of you. I'll never forget this famous reporter. I was, in this, I was at the White House for, with a friend of mine one time, and this famous reporter uh, called me the next day. And I was like, wow, this person's calling me. It's a person you saw on TV all the time in the 80s and 90s. 
And she called me, and she said, well, she was, she was sort of antagonizing me about the man that I was with. And she said, but there's something different about you. She called me reverend. She said, I see something different in you that I don't see in others. And she said, I see that same thing in you and I saw in Billy Graham. She said, what is it? <laughs> oh, when she opened that door, I took it. I said, well, to me, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, I'm a member of a so-and-so church. I said, well, I, talk, I said, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I said, that is what it's about. She said, okay. And then we just sort of closed the conversation. She called me back the next day. She said, I've been thinking about this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And she said, I know in, nobody else except for you and Billy Graham. And my father, priest, so-and-so, this is what they said. I don't believe he has a relationship with God like you do. And she said, would you talk to me about this relationship with God? And I led that woman to the Lord Jesus on the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a, and by, as a matter of fact, a year later, she took, she resigned from her position and she went into private life. And uh, to this day, it still amazes me that it doesn't matter where you are, how you are. If you represent the Lord in purity and sincerity, somebody's watching and you just don't know how a transformed life will change. And God has blessed me to be around people like that. Sometimes people, I'm planting a seed. Sometimes I can be an actual witness and lead them to the Lord. My point with all that is, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about being a witness. You say, well, Pastor Brian, you know, your life's perfect. My life is not perfect. As a matter of fact, I was going through all kinds of things at that time. I was transitioning to, from traveling to want to be a pastor. And I'm like, I was wrestling with all that. And, you know, when you're going through a life change, it's not fun, is it not? So, you know, you're, you're, you're facing all the insecurities, all the questions of life. You're making a job change. You know, you thought you were going this direction and you're going in another. And all these questions and financially. And Sheila's got, we've got two young children. And Sheila wants a third child, possibly. And I'm thinking, okay, um, all right, uh, what are we going to do here? And me stop traveling. I enjoy traveling. Then all of a sudden, the Lord began to deal with me about my own self. And the more I got confident in knowing his plan for my life, it didn't matter what I was going through. I was still a witness. Hey, and I want that for you. And we can have this same thing. The last thing I want to share with you is the resurrection the Lord gives us, not just eternal life and a promise, but eternal life right now. Turn to 1 Peter. Watch this. 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, 1 Peter chapter 1. Check this out. 1 Peter chapter 1. Watch this. This is powerful. So many people sort of bypass this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, watch this, who has, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Watch this now. It says, To an inheritance. Everybody say an inheritance. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. <laughs> and if y'all could go on to verse 5, watch this. It says in verse 5, And we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. You and I are kept by this precious power of this resurrection. And I just want to encourage you today, listen, you may be going through some things and, and may be dealing with some things that you don't understand. I want you to know, Jesus said there's more to this life and there's more in the next life than there is in this life. And what you do in this life counts for the next life. You say, Pastor Brian, I made some great mistakes. Hey, listen, the blood of Jesus is greater than any failure and God is not looking at your sins. He's looking at who you are. He wants to help you. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ will not only transform you for eternity, but it'll transform you every single day. I mean, when you tap into this power, the apostle Paul said it like this, that I may know him in Philippians 3.10 and the power, everybody say the power, the power of his resurrection and Jesus gift of eternal life is for, he is for heaven, but there's eternal life right now. You and I have the sense of eternal life inside of us. That's the beauty of knowing that we belong to God right now. So many people think, well, when I get to heaven, I will feel this way. You've got heaven on the inside if you only knew about it. I mean, if you really knew what was on the inside, if you really knew what's been given to you, and that's my job as a, as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a leader, is to coach you, counsel you, teach you, empower you to understand this greatness on the inside of you. It's, it's a great thing to know the very spirit that created the world, the very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is living on the inside of every single believer. Now, again, there are people that call themselves believers. They're not believers. 
Let's get that clear, okay? We can say rest in peace all day long to people who die, but I'm telling you what, there is no peace to somebody who dies without Jesus Christ. Let's just get it clear. I mean, without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, someone is separated from God for eternity. There's no rest in peace about it. Amy's dad back there had a really hard life, and I'm not here to point Amy out, but she'll be glad to testify, and she shares it on Facebook anyway, so if you share it on Facebook, I guess it's public. <laughs> Is that how that works, ladies and gentlemen? Anyway, Amy's made it clear that when I led her dad to the Lord, that's what secured his eternity. And, you know, it sure wasn't on his works and boy, life before that. And by the way, some people think it's because they're a good person and do this and they're good and they give this and give that. Listen, you can do all that. That's great. I encourage everybody to be good. Thank God for goodness. We need good people, okay? But goodness will not get you through the pearly gates, as the old song says in country music. There's only one way, and Jesus is that way. And I'm not here to just preach salvation to you. I'm just telling you, it's bothering me today that we have a lot of people that are saying that they're believers and they're not. Listen, when you're a believer, these things I'm talking to you about transform your life. I don't care how far you suppress it with sin and stupidity and selfishness. You are a miserable person if you're a believer and try to practice sin. It just will not work. But if you're a true child of God, if it's that seed of righteousness is on the inside of you, then what I'm saying to you over these last couple of minutes makes sense. Even though you may not be walking in the fullness, you may be, have all kinds of things coming at you, I'm telling you, he is still the resurrection of the life. And Jesus made it clear. He said to Martha in Lazarus' situation, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I just want to ask you today, what are you dealing with? What question that I could ask you that you need, be, need to be resurrected from? Is there a situation in your life? Then you need that resurrection power. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. I don't know. All I know is that resurrection power is available today. That same power that literally blew that grave door off, and I haven't been there yet, but they say those stones are heavy. And it wasn't just the stone itself. It was the way it happened and how it happened and the way that it did happen that proves to me that we not only say an awesome God, but God marks himself in time and says, listen, no one's going to outdo me. No one is going to outdo me. And I'm telling you what, whatever you need today and whatever you're in your life, I want to pray with you now. And as a matter of fact, we're going to close this service in just a moment. So if someone join me up here and play, I, I just want to pray with you about this. Whatever you're going through, maybe it is sickness in your body. I'm telling you what, he's still a healer. If it is a situation in your mind, he is a absolute prince of peace. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he was crucified on Mount Golgotha. And you know what that is? That's called the place of the skull, the place of the mind. That means there ought to be peace in you. You say, Pastor Brian, is Christianity perfect? Well, I'll never have any problems. No, you're going to have issues. You're going to wake up every day and have to fight things. My point is you have the ability to fight them. You have the weapons to fight them. Isn't that good news? I don't know about you, when all this happened last year, I didn't say, well, you know, COVID's greater than God. I said, no, God's greater than COVID, and we're going to win. Did we understand everything at first? Absolutely not. Did I understand all the science? And all? No, I didn't. But I understood the presence of God and the power of God that He would get us through this. And whatever may come. You know, the same thing we faced last year, people faced in 1941, on December the 7th, when Pearl Harbor was born. Bomb, bombs, excuse me. And of course, on 9 11, I was just up in New York and it just came back home and the tri towers fell. I was in Louisiana when it happened. And I'd just been to New York. I just ate there at the World Trade Center. I literally had ate there on the ground floor in that restaurant. There's a coffee shop there. I just had lunch with Dan Stratton, my friend, Wall Street Exchange. And boom, the world changed. But we made it through that, did we not? We made it through that. We're going to make it through this. We're going to make it through anything else. You know why? Because Jesus is Lord. You said, well, Pastor Brian, I'm facing this. I'm facing that. What about this question? What about that question? You know, I'm sure you got to remember that the disciples and all that, after Jesus was re resurrected from the dead, they didn't have a book to go to. They didn't have the internet or Facebook to go to. All they had was each other. And they, they, they encouraged themselves. But you know what they did have? They had an inner believing that what 
God had promised, God had done through Jesus. And of course, they saw him. It says he was on the earth for 40 days. That's a long time, is it not? And all these people saw him. And there's not just this book. There's all kinds of accounts outside of this book of Jesus' appearance. And by the way, we got to remember, if it was a hoax, it is the greatest hoax there's ever been. Because you know what? I have not met Jesus as far as physically, but I'm telling you what, on October the 16th, 1983, he transformed my life, and I have never been the same. Do I have things I go through? Yes, I have things I go through, but I go through them. I have not gone through one situation yet, not now, that I have not won the victory over in a matter of time. And I've gone through some challenging situations, very challenging. But at the same time, there's always been a place of victory. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me just pray for you right now. Whatever you're going through, it may be in a marriage situation, family situation, it may be in your body. If it is in your body and for those that are watching, just take a moment right now and place your hand. With nobody looking around, just a moment here of respect. Let that power of the Lord, that Holy Spirit power, come on your body right now. If you're dealing with some intestinal issues or or physical part of your body, just put your hand right there right now. And let's just believe in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the presence of the Holy Spirit to minister to every person in this auditorium and those watching. This resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ that transforms people through the ages, transforms people right now. And so we just believe for healing in bodies right now. We speak to those sicknesses and diseases and command them in Jesus' name to be gone and be made whole in these people's bodies. Also, people that are dealing with depression, anxiety, mental torment, may you be free from that in Jesus' name. Those that are dealing with financial needs, may a revelation of Jesus, the provider, be made manifest to them. And finally, those who need wisdom concerning relationships, concerning the things of life and questions of life, may that wisdom come in Jesus' name. Let's all say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being the resurrected Savior. I acknowledge you in every area of my life. I give you all things. Be Lord of all. In everything in my life, I surrender all. I give it all to you. And I thank you. The very power that raised you from the dead is working in my life in these areas for your glory. In Jesus, your name, I commit myself. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, if you meant it from your heart, if you want a dedication of consecration that is beyond yourself, then you sealed that with the Lord today. You make it a permanent commitment. Listen, Christianity is not about perfect people. It's about a perfect Savior, okay? And all He needs is your perfect availability. He just needs you to be available to Him. Listen, He can do more in your life in the next three days than you have done in the last three years if you'll give it to Him. I promise you. I know you're busy. I know technology is screaming at you. I know your problems are screaming at you. And I understand the devil is too. But I'm telling you, the voice of God is greater and more powerful than any of that. He wants to help you to understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And this resurrection power is not to be celebrated one time a year. I celebrate it every single day. Every single day, I don't do this to, to, to draw attention to me, please, not at all. But I, I take communion every day to do two things. Number one, to remember his body and his blood, okay, to remember it. And then number two, to rejoice in it. To rejoice in the fact that his body and his blood is not in a grave over in Jerusalem. Not only, he's, he's in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. And since he is alive, I'm alive. And since he is alive, that means everything he's promised is alive. And if that be the truth, which it is, then there's no way that I can lose in this life or the next. And so I just keep moving forward, saying that the older I get, the better I get. And a billion years from now, the older I get, the better I get. <laughs> and so will you. Hey, Robert, if you're going to close this service, and I want to thank y'all for being here today. It's so good to see y'all. We we appreciate you being here today. It's awesome to be in this service today and seeing people. Again, I remember a year ago, it was so strange, so weird, preaching to a whole bunch of empty chairs, but hey, I did it. Thanks to Miss Janet and so many faithful people. I mean, so many of you so faithful to, to watch. And, and I cannot tell you how thankful I am to the faithfulness of people connected to this church. I'm telling you. And people sending me notes. 
about my messages. You know, I felt so weird talking to cameras and not seeing anybody, okay? Even though I could do it and all that. But people are telling me, you know, attaboy notes and all this. You know, Amy, those are good things to have. You know, you appreciate that. And, uh, you know, Pastor Brian, that was a good message. Or I like this or like that. And even somebody one time said, I really like that suit of clothes. I felt really good because I picked it out all by myself. <laughs> They said, did Sheila buy that shirt? No, Sheila don't buy all my shirts. I buy all my shirts. Anyway, anyway, I love Sheila. She's a great dresser. But I, listen, men, we can dress ourselves. Come on, guys. Man. Come on now. You, listen, if you're over 50 years old and your wife's dressing you, shame, shame, shame on you, okay? <laughs> you need to learn how to dress yourself. If not, come see me and I'll teach you how to dress, okay? We can match those pants and those shoes, all right? And make you look just good, all right? You say, Pastor Brian, I don't care how I wear. I'm going to wear the same clothes over and over. Don't you do this. This ain't the wild, wild west, okay? You look good, all right? When I'm married, I don't need to. Listen, you need to take a bath. Why am I talking about all this? Anyway. <laughs> You, you need to take a bath. You need to brush your teeth, okay? You need, by the way, men, if you haven't bought cologne since the day you were married, please see me after the service, and we will help you in the name of Jesus. You say, Pastor Brian, that's not has a resurrection. Listen, I'm trying to resurrect your marriage. Because <laughs> thou stinketh, okay? <laughs> so, you know, not seriously. I love you, but come on, guys. Seriously, man. I mean, really, in, in, the, in the words of somebody we know, really. Anyway, Robert, come on up here, and um, if we could be of any service to you, we want to help you. Contact me, okay? We want to pray with you. Listen, I do not have a crystal ball in my house, but if you will contact me, I want to pray for you. Maybe I can't go to the hospitals and all that right now in situations, but we can pray the prayer of agreement. We had three families in our hospital three families in the hospital this week. I couldn't go see them, William. I mean, we just can't because of the rules. But you know what? That doesn't, permit, that doesn't stop me from praying and believing God. Amen? And listen, it ain't about me going and seeing somebody. You know, I want to see some people. I love people. I want to go see them. I want to encourage them, okay? The last place you want to be is in a hospital by yourself. However, the presence of God invading that hospital room and healing, moving through that situation, and the wisdom of God to protect the doctors to help that person, that's what I want to pray about. That's what I want to be in agreement about. And then I'm looking forward to a good report when it's all said and done. That's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And if I don't know that, if we don't know that as a team, we can't pray that. But if you'll communicate that with us, we'll stand with you. We'll believe the best. Do all situations turn around? No, sometimes they just don't. But you know, I'm not batting for just, you know, uh, to try to just get a couple. I, I'm still wanting 100%, Robert. Yeah, we've had some deaths this past year. I'm disappointed in. But we've also had some great victories. I've seen some people healed in this very room that were to death's door, that were seriously in trouble, but a resurrected Savior invaded that situation. So never give up or give out and give up on the fact that Jesus is still who He is. Even though you may understand what you're going through right now, I promise you, somebody else is going through it. And if somebody else has gone through it and won the victory, that's why I love studying the, the, the history of others. I really just feed off that. It's one of the things that inspires me, Robert, when I see somebody that's gone through something. I talked to somebody this week who went through something that was similar to a situation like mine, and they had gone through it with flying colors. I mean, they went through victorious. And I said, well, God's no respecter of persons, Miss Vivian. He loves them. He loves me, and together we're going to win that situation. And he did, and we did, and we all won it. And that's the goodness of our God. And he hasn't forgotten your name or where you live. He is with you, and we want to be with you and let us know.